There we go. Now we start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live stream. Today's live stream. We're going to be working on a very cool character, very iconic monster from D&D. As you guys know, I'm a huge fan of D&D and Pathfinder, so this one's going to be fun. Shall we start then? Let's go. So just checking here that we got the, the music on, we got the microphone on, and we got everyone here on the chat. Welcome, guys. Wow, 50 viewers already? That's great. Cool. So today the goal is going to be to create a Mind Flayer. Again, a very iconic um, character from D&D. And uh, we're going to be focusing on generating a very cool bust for the character so that we can later on 3D print it. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can get all of this like assets that we're creating to you guys so that you can also like 3D print, 3D print them yourself. And we got Athel. What's up, my friend? Adarle. Very well. So usually when we start a character, especially in Seabrush, we always want to like create the, the base blocking of the character. And when looking at this guy, the first thing I see is that he has a huge, huge head and then of course the tentacles on the uh, on the neck. So I don't like working with perspective. I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to start pushing some of these things over here. Welcome. Welcome, my friend. Wait, we didn't see the little thing. There we go. There we go. My bad. So, yeah, we got a subscription. There you go. Welcome, my friends. Welcome. Cool. So, I'm just going to use here my move brush to start, like, pushing and pulling all of these things around. And we're going to generate or we're going to start um, creating. Uh, thanks for the sub, my friend. We're going to start creating the basic shape of the head. Now, I'm going to mask here. I'm going to press control and mask this area right here. And we're gonna do the neck by just extruding this thing down like this. Usually the neck has a little bit of an inclination to the back part and uh, and that's what we get. So, yep, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna use move brush again and we're gonna start generating a little bit of the shoulders and just a little bit of the chest, just to get a general idea of where this character thing would be. You can see he's got very like tall shoulders. So I'm actually gonna push them up a little bit more. And this is just a very basic base mesh that I like to use whenever I'm doing characters so that everything falls well, into place. Now, as you can see, the shape of this character is kind of like this rhomboid thing, right? Like pushing on the sides. Uh, these guys are very famous in the D&D lore because they are uh, quite difficult, right? Like they're, I think, like challenge rating eight or something. So they're supposed to be mid to high level uh, creatures. And the interesting thing about these guys is that they got like psychic powers. So... They are part of this like collective uh, mind hive. There's like a mother brain similar to the one that we see in like Metroid and all of these guys are controlled by this. Uh, sorry for asking, but when is the next portfolio review by RVR132? No man, no, do not apologize for asking question. That's what this stream is for. The next one's gonna be in August. So roughly halfway through August, we're gonna have our next portfolio review. You can already go into our Discord channel and submit. So yeah, feel free to do that. There we go. So on the center, I see that there's like a like a split here on the skull. Really weird split. I'm using this reference. This is on like an old school version of the of the Mind Flayers. Every new edition and every new variation, there's always like a small changes to the characters. But I really like this one. I think this was the first edition that I played when I first started playing D and D. I played the 3.5, and um, and I think this was the picture on the book for for the Mind Flayers. Begna, right? What is portfolio review? Okay, so webinar. If you're not aware, we are um, we're a 3D uh, school pretty much. So I teach about the 3D world, and a lot of our students are here to learn and uh, improve their 3D arts. If you have a portfolio in ArtStation, again models, drawings, whatever, you can submit that link, and I go over them and I give you feedback and advice on what things to to improve or to change to get you better sh a better shot at uh, landing a, a job at the industry. So if you want to work for like big video game companies and things like that, you're going to need a portfolio. And uh, once you have a polished portfolio, you can start presenting it to, to the big companies and hopefully get a job in the industry. So we do this dynamic every month where you guys submit your portfolios on our Discord channel and I go over them to help you out and give you advice. Yep, there you go. Sorry there, just uh, link the, the, the um, what's the word? The Discord so that we can check that one okay so here what i'm doing is i'm working on what we call the primary forms which are the main shapes of the head of the character 
Now, a very, very important part of this character, of course, are the tentacles. However, I actually don't want to, like, merge the tentacles just yet, because if I do that, one of the things that's going to happen is it's going to be very difficult to work here on the bottom side of the character. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to Subtool, and I'm going to append a new sphere. So append sphere. There we go. I'm going to make that sphere very small. And then I'm going to use a brush, very cool brush, called the Curve Brush. Uh, where is it? Curve Tooth. There we go. And this brush is a really like a um, flexible thing because we can just draw and generate a curve. If we press uh, the, the X key, we get symmetry, of course, and uh, we're ready to, to get this sort of like effect. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw one curve right here to draw the first like side tentacles. So you can see they kind of like do this sort of like thing. And then I can I can actually like modify and push the the curve a little bit. Now the cool thing about uh, curve brushes is that as long as you don't delete the curve, you can still modify them slightly and generate something very cool. One thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to stroke, curve functions, or sorry, curve, where is it? Curve modifiers, there we go, curve fall off. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the size. So what that does, as you can see, is it generates a tapered effect on the curve. But in this case, I want this to be inverse. So I'm just gonna do this option, flip vertically, there we go. And when I click, look at that we get this very very nice like a tendril sort of thing now i do feel like that's a little bit too intense so i'm gonna go to this point right here actually this point right here and bring it lower probably like halfway there we go uh, and then i'm gonna make the brush bigger there we go probably a little bit smaller a little bit bigger and that's it so that looks a little bit better for for what I'm trying to do. And we can move this first part right there. Now I'm gonna uh, click on the geometry to delete the curve. I can no longer modify that curve. So if I want to move that thing, I'm gonna have to use uh, things such as like the move brush or something, which is fine. It's a very, very like a cool thing that we can do right here. And it says, cool tricks, you always learn something new. Yeah, that's uh, that's my personal motto, guys. You know it, always learning, always improving. So uh, th that's the thing about the 3D world. There's always little tips, tricks, and like techniques. Even like, l I, I think it was yesterday, I was working in Blender and um, I saw a like a TikTok or something where someone showed you how to bring back the modifier box once you like apply it. And it's like, really? I've been using Blender for a couple of years now and uh, I didn't know that you could bring that thing back, which would have been very, very helpful. So there's so many things in softwares that's pretty much impossible to know everything from from like uh, from the start so I'm gonna grab again my curve to right here and if we draw a curve down the middle we should be able to create a centered like tentacle I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger a little bit smaller there we go we can get it right around there and start giving it a little bit of uh, a little bit of curvature I think we can make it definitely like bigger and let's bring it down there we go now I'm gonna press R which is just a rotation I'm gonna rotate this forward so they can have a better like a uh, insertion point and usually these guys they have four tentacles right they, they create like this super weird thing where they just like <laughs> grab your face and try to uh, like consume your brains so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna draw one more tentacle so I'm gonna click again the head and we're gonna draw one more tentacle this one's a little bit longer you can see it's this one on the back of the of the throat and then I'm just gonna move this like this very important to try to keep the curvature of the well of this curve as clean as possible so like the tip and everything I want to make it very simple we're gonna post this guy later don't worry about that but right now I just want to have like the base of the element perfect so yeah, that's it. We got the like the main sections right there. So one thing that could we could do here, but again, it's, it, it could be a little bit tricky, is we could combine both tools, right? We can combine the tentacles and the head. But I'm a little bit concerned about this part right here on the on the back part of the neck, where it's not gonna be um, it's not gonna be possible to sculpt both elements. But here's a trick. I'm gonna go to the head. I'm gonna isolate it real quick. Oh, there we go. And then with Control and Shift, I'm gonna change to select lasso. And I'm gonna select it just the head and I'm gonna go to split and then split hidden so now the head the neck and the tentacles are three different pieces this tentacles right here I'm gonna push them up and then this head right here I'm gonna say merge merge down and hit okay 
So now, if I Dynamesh, you can see that the tentacles and the head are one single piece and the next is a separate piece. So that way I can work on this part or I can work on the back part of the tentacles a lot easier. So with that done, I should be able to, for instance, bridge this thing right here and generate the connection that we're seeing there on the console. There's a question, I think. Uh, should I have Seabrush stuff in my portfolio if I want to via the... Yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, Seabrush is a, is, a, is a character or people like... Um, what's the word? People think about Seabrush more when you talk about characters, but um, environment artists use it all the time. I actually have a, a project. I'm not going to spoil it right now, but I, I have a project that I want to do for like environment uh, creation for, for games. And, um, and we're going to be using Seabrush quite a bit for that one. So it's a very cool sculpture. And then uh, we optimize it for games and we do like uh, tileable textures and uh, trim sheets and things like that. So so yes, if you are if you want to be an environment artist, I would say, I mean, it depends on what kind of environment artist, but usually uh, environment artists are going to be using Seabrush quite a bit as well. Right now, like the three main tools that everyone is using on the industry are a DCC application, application such as Maya or Blender, and then uh, what's the word? We're using um, ZBrush and then Substance Painter for, for textures. You can also use like Quicksilver or Marmoset, but Substance Painter is the, it's like the industry standard. So there you go. As you can see here, what we're doing is we're generating the nice little like transition into the tentacles of the character. It kind of looks like, a, like an elephant, like the tusks of an elephant. I'm gonna push this in a little bit more. Harambe, what's up, my friend? Welcome. Doing good. Houdini is a great tool, but Houdini is a different language. Uh, I always compare like uh, Maya, Blender, 3D Studio Max to learning like Italian, Spanish, uh, Portuguese. They're all like a similar Latin languages, right? So, so there is similar. And then if you go to Houdini, that's like learning I don't know German. So the structure, the way you work, the the way you create models, it's it's more procedural. So Houdini is like the go-to object or the go-to software if you want to do, um, what's the word, effects. So if you want to do like fire, water simulation and stuff like that, uh, you're definitely going to go Houdini. Yeah, that's a nice uh, way to think about them, right? So yeah, there, there are softwares that are really close to, to the way they work and then there's others that are like really, really different. So you, you, you really need to learn about uh, a completely different, uh, again, like a mindset to, to get that. Okay. Kind of want to make this a little bit rounder. Let's add a little bit of volume here on the, uh, what's the word, on the, Eyes. There we go. Cool. Let's add now the eyes. So very simple process. We just append the sphere, select the sphere. We scale the sphere in and we push this up to the side. We scale it again to to find the, the proper size. Usually I like to go for smaller eyes. Smaller eyes give you this sort of like realism thing. If you go with big eyes, you start getting this sort of like a Disney uh, style thing. So something like that. And then we're just gonna mirror this to the other side. And the cool thing about eyes and any other subtool that you add is that they act as masks. So now if I start adding like the, like the eyelids right here, you can see they go around the eyes and they generate a very cool effect. I would expect it to be some sort of like a jaw over here, so. Let's go a little bit to the neck. I'm gonna clean up the, the border of that neck. I can see I have some of my proportions off. So I think the head should be a lot higher or the eyes a lot lower to make them a little bit meaner. And now let's grab the eyes again. Oh, a quick way to switch between subtools is by just pressing Alt and click on the eye. And that one's gonna allow you to just like select instead of having to go here to the subtool option, just press Alt and, uh, and move it around. There we go. 
So we got a question here. It says, how do you keep your skills updated with the evolving industry trends? So one of the main things that you need to do is make sure that you're always looking for what's new in the industry. Every now and then there's going to be new technologies, but not all of these new technologies are going to be easily applicable to what you're doing at that specific moment. However, you need to be aware of what's happening. I'm going to do a quick example. In Blender, we got geometry nodes and everyone's talking about geometry nodes. They're very cool. They're very useful. But for some things like game development, they can be a little bit tricky to integrate into your pipeline. So my best advice is always look for the things that are uh, like up and coming in the industry and try to think about how you can implement those in your workflow. If you do that, you might find some secret things here and there that are going to really, really improve your, um, your process. That looks a little bit better. I still think he doesn't look as mean as in the picture. I mean, that's a very like low quality picture, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the eyes a little bit further up. That's gonna make him a lot angrier. There we go. That's a little bit better. I can I can see a little bit of a cavity right around here, so I'm gonna carve in a little bit and just keep adding volume on these areas. And this thing kind of like blends into the tentacles over here. There we go. As you can see, I'm not really increasing my Dynamesh. This is a very common mistake that I see people make. They will increase the Dynamesh resolution heavily, very fast when they're starting to sculpt. And you want to try to to not do that unless it's necessary. My, my rule of thumb is not to increase the resolution of your character or of your, of your sculpt unless you really need it. Now here I'm trying to to give this thing a little bit of a, of a rotation to you know make it a little bit more interesting. Now let's fill in the back part. This is another very common mistake that people make when they're sculpting. They will not um, work on areas that they think are not going to be seen. But especially if we're going to like 3D print this guy, for instance. Like people are gonna be able to analyze our sculpt from every single like side, so it's very important that we spend a little bit of time here on the on the back part of the character as well to make sure that every single part looks nice. Bileya 3D Arshel, welcome, my friend. Welcome. Yeah. So as I was mentioning on the on the intro video, where um, we got the the new animations for for followers and and stuff. So if you guys are not following and you want to check it out, it's right there on the. It's available, it's enabled. Uh, we got a question from Andy. When we create buff characters, how much of the brush strokes should we smooth out? I kind of like the effect it gives on the skin, a bit bumpy. What is your opinion? Yeah, you can keep the, the like the stripes that you, that you do. I recommend changing to a round alpha because that's gonna give you something that looks a little bit more like a muscle stripes. The square alpha tends to look very like, I don't know, brush strokey. So I recommend changes to a, to a round alpha um, because it's gonna give you a little bit more of an organic look. But yeah, you can leave the texture. I, I usually like to leave the texture. I was talking about this with a with a good friend of mine, and um, and there's always like traditions, right, or, or styles, and uh, you as an artist are gonna decide what kind of style you you like on your characters. Mine tends to always be a little bit like um, what's the word? Um, it, it's, it's gonna sound weird, but it's kind of like a little bit of a raw sort of style where, where things and some like uh, like uh, like details and, and uh, elements of her, of her brush strokes are, are still like seen. Um, of course, not every production is gonna allow you to do that. Some productions you need to follow the rules perfectly. But when I'm doing my own stuff, I always like to leave this sort of like texture that we're seeing here on this character, for instance. A very stressful morning for Harambe. What's that? Why is that, my friend? It's Friday. Weekend is very, very close. Okay, I'm, I'm increasing the resolution here and I'm just gonna start like defining the eyes a little bit more. And over here, I kind of I want to add like sort of like gills or like membranes thingies, just like floating and, and moving around. And since I, I really want to 3D print this guy, I'm going to be a little bit more exaggerated on like the bumps and the wrinkles and things like that. Because when you 3D print, we did this uh, a couple of sessions ago, the little kindred mask. When you 3D print, you lose a lot of detail. So you need to be a little bit more um, extreme than you would 
think you would normally need for this kind of things so that when you 3D print, all of that detail is like nicely preserved. So for instance, here with Damien Standard, we can start adding some of those like big wrinkles on the eye. This is gonna give us a very, very nice effect. Now, I like the sort of like folds that we're getting from one tentacle to the other. So here's how you can do them. If you wanna do folds between two different areas, first add the lines that are gonna be creating the tension points, like the skin folds on the element. And once you do that, remove a little bit of volume in between those lines and blend them together. A very common mistake people make when they're doing wrinkles and things like that is they only add or remove the volume, but the wrinkle is both a peak and a valley. So you're gonna see a little bit of both of those effects on the, on the element. And that's gonna help you create the, the sort of like tension lines that we can see right here. Then when we smooth a little bit, very, very softly, we don't want to destroy what we just did. It's going to look a lot more tense than what we used to have. There we go. That's maybe a little bit too extreme, so I'm going to use again clay buildup to, to fill a little bit of that effect in. But just those dips right there, for, for miniature painting, those are always very, very fun to paint because you can always add a little bit of shadow and a little bit of highlight right there. Baldur's Gate is coming next week, by the way, guys. I, I, I pre-ordered that game like two years ago and uh, I haven't played it since. I played it a little bit back when it was in, in, early, in early access, but the full game is coming next week. And I actually think... We are gonna do it, I promise. We're gonna do it because Baldur's Gate has a stream mode where you guys can vote on the decisions that I'm making as I play the game. So we're gonna play it. We are gonna play it. Here together on the stream, we're gonna play it. Let's do a let's play because we've been doing a lot of work. I think I deserve a, a little bit of time off to, to just play the game. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good game. It's really, really good. Larian has always been a great studio. Actually, I, I, I've always said this, that I, I, I don't see myself working on a studio because um, I, I really like the, the stuff that I do as a, as a teacher and uh, with my little studio over here. But um, if I were to work on a place, I think I would like to work at Larian. But they're in Europe, I think. Larian seems like a really cool place to, to work. Yeah, I got the I got the Elegoo Elegoo uh, three, so it, it also is 4K and it's ha it's a small, but um, it, it can I think it can get this um, this creature done if we if we try it. Let's add a little bit of variation here on the forms. So as you can see, I'm carving and then I'm adding a little bit of volume, and this is creating some like, like interesting bumps. I'm taking a lot of uh, artistic liberties, to be honest, but um, I think that's one of the magics about like fantasy that you can always like create your own stuff. This week, I, I was telling my my party, I, I play D and D. Well, we're playing Pathfinder now um, with the system, and um, I was telling my party that I missed them this week because we we didn't get to to play. Rip Glaucolongi material. This is the one, right? Oh no, it's just not. There we go. I like both. The other one was the, the standard like matte cap material. Both are really good. There we go. Just adding a little bit of ridges. If it's too much, for instance, if, if I see that there's too too much like detail, because that's another thing. When you're when you're like doing a design where you're designing something you you need to keep in mind something called the rest areas you cannot just like overload everything with that detail because it looks very very weird so i might need to do a little bit of cleanup here i'm gonna push the the sides of the head a little bit more push the psychomatic arc just to get that nice little curvature so i can see this is like too much so just with trim dynamic trim dynamic is a great brush to to clean surfaces without deleting the form so you keep the form, but just simplify it, which is really, really good. MacMoon! Hi, Mr. Don Ave Lincoln. MacMoon, it's been a long time, my friend. It's been a long time since you've been here, right? Haven't seen you in a while. MacMoon was one of our uh, viewers back when uh, I was streaming 
in the pandemic like two years ago or three years ago he's a former student of mine if i'm not mistaken as well yeah 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 i remember i remember So the tentacles are going to be very simple, so I'm just going to smooth them out. I'm going to add a little bit of texture later on, uh, but in regards to the like the surface of them, they should be like, pretty pretty clean. I'm just going to try to remove a little bit of the of the hardness that they have on some of the like the bends, the low resolution of things. These guys have ears. I kind of feel like adding like, some like holes in there, especially from a side view. That kind of looks interesting. So, like creating some cavities. This call. You, you kind of always want to have something interesting again, especially for for miniature painting. Flat areas are always very boring because you can't do much. So, adding this will like. Like little details that are not really going to affect the silhouette, but are going to push the the design a little bit more. I think could potentially be a, a good thing. And again, that's one of the cool things about being an artist, right? You can take some liberties every now and then, especially when you're working on this or like personal projects. No one's telling you like, oh, that's wrong or that shouldn't be. Or, that's not what I want. You don't have a client. It's usually a, a good way to, to do it. Did I move to Colombia? No, no, no. I'm still in Mexico. I've never been to Colombia. Actually, I've never been south of Mexico, to be honest. I want to go to Peru. Peru seems like a fun place. Well, I want to go to Machu Picchu, so... Oh, that's another great question. So, what is a piece of advice that I would like to have when I was starting the 3D world, I think one of the best ones would be be patient. When we start, we always tend to be very impatient and we want to be amazing artists in like no time, right? Like we want to be super, super fast and create amazing things really quick. But the thing is, there's a learning curve. There's a, it's a process that you need to follow and you're going to see it the more you do it. I've been doing this for more than 12 years and um, every time I do something new, I, I understand all of the things that I did before and how they affect and uh, improve my art throughout the years. So one of the best advices I can give anyone is try to be patient. Be patient, just keep learning, keep improving, and you're gonna get there. That would be my advice for, for a, a, a new artist uh, getting into this uh, 3D world. Okay, I'm gonna use Stream Dynamic here to sharpen the zygomatic arch a little bit more. There we go. Yeah, I think one of the issues about art is that it's very easy to see the highlights of every single artist. Like, if you go to my portfolio, if you go to, like, the most famous artists like uh, Glauco Longhi, Raphael Grassetti, and you see their stuff, you're like, man, this guy is a god, like, when am I gonna get there? But you don't see all of the failures, you don't see all of the bad sculpts, you don't see all of the pain, all of the all of the um, frustration and, and anxiety of, uh, of learning new things and, and improving your art. Because you like, we usually don't like to share that kind of stuff. But it is part of the process, and then no one was born knowing every single thing. So what I always like to tell myself is, I, I, I like to compare myself to myself. So I like to see where I was like one year ago, six months ago, and compare and see if I've improved in my art. And if I have, then I'm good. I'm in a good path. That means that I'm I'm improving and I'm learning. Um, and uh, and if you if you really 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 want to compare yourself to like a pro artist, my best advice is compare yourself on the proper time frame. So, I think for instance, Rafael Grassetti, I, I've always find him like really really inspiring. He's a great great character artist. But he has I think right now like 24 years of experience. So my like my my bar should be like okay when I have 20 years of experience, I should be close to the level that Rafael Grassetti is right now. If I can get there faster, then that's great. If I 
don't, well, I need to improve something, right? But the thing is, when I am 24 years, when I have 24 years, or when I get to 24 years of experience, this guy is going to be like at 36 years of experience. So he's going to be on a completely different level, right? So, so that's why it's not a good idea to compare yourself to other artists because everyone's walking their own path. And if you, if you compare to yourself to that path, you're never going to achieve it. You're never going to get there because every time you look at him, he's going to be better and better and better. So the best thing you can do is just compare yourself to yourself. That's going to be a lot better for your, for your mental health as well. How do you sculpt fabric in ZBrush? That's a great question. So there's a couple of ways. You can use dynamics. ZBrush has this dynamic thing where you can just like drop a piece of cloth and uh, it will like conform to the shape of your character. But to be honest, the best way is just look at a lot of reference. Look at reference, look at how pants and shirts fold and try to mimic those folds. There are some alphas out there that uh, capture the folds of the cloth and they're like relatively good. Uh, you can use those. But if you want like the most, the best realistic fabric use marvelous designer <laughs> i know it's like a cheap answer it's like oh but how why are you saying this why why can't we become like masters at sculpting cloth you can but it's gonna be a lot of investment in time if you want to do it go for it if you want to do it like simple and you're in the production and time is important then just simulate the cloth with marvelous designer give it a couple of passes here inside of seabrush and um and then just uh continue working from there oh that's a great question uh, Moon is asking, what do you think about AIs? AIs are really interesting. I, I kind of feel like they're like, a, like your best friend that can betray you or something like that. Because with AIs, you can do so many things very quickly. I personally use them quite a bit for like, uh, like ChatGPT and stuff like that to write like my scripts and things like that. But I can see the fear in, in seeing how they could eventually take over the creative world. I, I, my personal opinion, and we did a short uh, not so long ago about this, is we need to understand that they're not going away, right? Like, they're not going to just, like, disappear tomorrow and that's it. Like, something incredibly, like, big sh would need to happen for that to occur. So we need to see them as part of our workflows now and see how we can use them ethically without hurting or affecting anyone, but we need to use them as part of our, of our portfolio. A great example that I saw a couple of months ago was someone talking about Photoshop. Photoshop came into existence in 1990. Eight, I think, or something like close to that point. Um, and when Photoshop came uh, into existence, people thought like, oh, photographers are going to be out of work. Like, that's it. The traditional photography is dead. Now everyone's just going to take a picture and they're going to be editing it. And that's it. Same thing with digital cameras, right? Like when digital cameras came around, people were like, oh, that's it. Film is gone. And we can see it. Oppenheimer just released and uh, everyone's like uh, talking very, very good things about it. So it's not that it's going to be gone, but there's going to be a like democratic Criticization of the process so more people are going to be able to do cool stuff but that doesn't mean that all of the people that have been doing it traditionally are just going to be out of a job you need to adapt to it and you need to use it to your own advantage again without hurting anyone and yes unfortunately industries will change so maybe if you were a texture artist and you were doing everything in substance designer well now you're going to have to learn how to do similar things and then tweak them in substance designer but start with a prompt maybe on um on, a, on an ai same for like modelers i have already seen some modeling things where where you can uh, just say, hey, I want like a barrel, right? And uh, and the AI will construct the barrel for you. But that barrel might need some changes, might need some adjustments. So that's when you as an artist are gonna be um, required to polish and clean that sort of stuff. So it's uh, it's an interesting thing, uh, definitely. And, uh, and we definitely need, I think this is an important thing, and that's what the writers are doing right now in the United States. We do need to push back if we see that certain like lines are being crossed and and people are abusing uh, AI and uh, and just like destroying like jobs and things like that. But again, they're a tool. So as long as we can use the tool ethically and efficiently, I think they're good for us. It's a standard. Uh, or no, what's uh, Dorky Bots? I think it's also sticks to everything in life to never compare to others, but themselves humble team too. Yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the standard, Daniel. Can you explain? I'm not sure if you meant the AI or the the comparing thing that we were talking about. What do you guys think? Is it good? Should we jump into details? I think we got a good form right now. What do you guys think? The AI, says Daniel. Yes, the AI is definitely a standard. And, and again, like people are going to use it. 
it's it's fine for certain things like uh we're trying some subtitle ai for our videos where it does it automatically and it's really good tiktok has some really amazing tools to do that so are our people who were doing subtitles going to be out of a work well maybe but if they use that tool to help themselves on their work they could be more efficient and get um more clients and stuff like that so so it's a matter of who's willing to pay for your for your craft right so so yeah it looks very cool says wenver em i think i think we should push it to details then and uh if you think it's cool and you're not subscribed or not subscribed if you're not following make sure to follow we're really close to our, our goal today just 10 more followers i even prepared some cool animations for you guys there we go yeah if you got some bits let's appreciate it as well thank you I actually did a, a well not did I I got a little gift for the bits as well, so you guys haven't seen that one yet. And remember, if you subscribe or follow here on the um, on the Twitch channel, we got some cool perks on the Discord as well. You get like a special title and everything. Okay, so there's two ways in which we can approach the next step. And uh, I'm gonna ask you guys what you think should be the best. We can increase the resolution of our Dynamesh. Right now we're in 112 resolution, which is not that much. Or we can try to rebuild the loops with a proper topology so that all of the detail falls better into the element. What should we do? What do you guys think should be the option? Should we just increase the Dynamesh resolution or should we try to get proper topology? I wanna see the opinions. The paintbrush witch, welcome, my friend, welcome. Siri mesh, someone is saying Siri mesh. Siri mesh is a really good option. And that's usually the option that I like to, to use. Yes, that's right, Harambe, the project details technique. So for those of you who haven't seen this technique, it's not like un, un, like uncommon. Um, but it's a, it's a really good one. So here it goes. First, you grab your head and you duplicate your object. Once you duplicate your object on one of those duplications, you're going to use your C remesh option. So we're going to go to geometry, C remesh, and we're going to C remesh the whole thing. This is going to destroy a lot of the detail. We're going to lose a lot of the detail because it's going to minimize and simplify the topology. But it should also give us some really interesting loops, especially in parts like the eyes and the tentacles that are going to allow us to sculpt things a little bit better. Now you press Ctrl D to duplicate this a couple of times. One, two, two times should be more than enough. And we bring back the other one and we're just gonna go to this new one and hit project, project all. So now what we've done is, is we've successfully transferred all of the details from our Dynamesh into a subdivision mesh. And this is way, way better because later on, if we want to do UVs, displacement or things like that, it's gonna be a lot easier. Uh, this might not be animation ready, like there might be some loops that are not perfect, but this is a lot cleaner than Dynamesh. So now I'm gonna give it a one more subdivision with Control D and let's start doing some cleanup. I always like to start with the eyes. They're very, very fun. So let's isolate the eyes real quick. And let's work here on the ice. See remesh and project. Yes. Oh yeah, the next course, guys. It's looking very nice. I I um, I'm not gonna spoil it. I I'm really really holding myself back because I don't wanna spoil it. It's a character. That's what I can say. It's a character. So it's a lot of seabrush. Pretty much everything is on seabrush. We do see a little bit of render at the end. And I do cover render in Blender and in Maya. So if you are either a Maya or Blender user, you're gonna be able to, to follow along. So it's a character, it's a very cool character. We go a lot about, uh, we go over a lot of anatomy. So I know people have been asking for an anatomy course. This one has a heavy emphasis on, on anatomy. And uh, yeah, I think you guys, uh, no, it's not, oh, um, Sarn has seen it. So what do you think Sarn? Is it, uh, is it fantasy? Could we? Could we consider it a fantasy character? I, th I think I think we could consider it kind of like a like a fantasy character. It's a very cool character. That's all I can say. It's a bit fantasy, right? 
It's a... it's a... Ah, I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it. Just just wait, guys. Just wait. I'm pretty sure next week I'm going to be able to share uh, more progress. I was hoping that I could finish it by today so that we could release it um, like this weekend. But it's it's been a little bit more challenging, so it's going to take a little bit more. I want to make sure that I, I, I deliver the best the best stuff. So if you guys want to know when we when the next course releases and be up to date with everything, make sure to either check um, our Discord channel or also our, our YouTube channel. I'm uh, uploading videos every day. Small shorts, longer versions, and shorts every now and then as well. So we're not stopping, my friends. We're not stopping. It's been really fun, to be honest. I think this has been one of the best decisions of my life so far, starting this new brand. And we got a follower. No, a subscription. Weber, thanks for the subscription, my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you for the sub. Now here's a trick. Uh, this is another one of my like uh, techniques that I like to show when we're doing like wrinkles and things like that. A very common mistake that people make is they'll just draw a wrinkle like this. And sometimes it's fine, but more often than not, this looks very, very bad, very weird. So this is called the crisscross technique. It's criss, oh, criss, cross, criss, cross, criss, cross. You do that sort of like crisscross effect. Thank you, my friend, for the uh, bits. Are those bits? Yeah, cheers, there you go. So uh, this crisscross technique allows us to get something a little bit more natural looking. Very, very important for, for this sort of effects. And now here, I don't, I can't really see what's going on in the concept, so I'm gonna use my artistic knowledge to just create like these wrinkles that are flowing in this sort of direction. There we go, we got more bits by Daniel. Thank you very much, my friend. Wow, a thousand bits? Nice! Dude, you really are supporting us quite a bit. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's very funny. I, I, I did streams uh, again on the pandemic and uh, we got a couple of subs and we got a lot of followers back then. But now, I don't know, it's uh, like things are changing and I, I can see I can see myself doing this for for a long time if you guys keep supporting me this way. Thank you, thank you very much, guys. Again, uh, it, it was a hard decision a couple of months back. Like I was feeling a little bit lost as an artist, to be honest, and I really didn't know what I wanted. And then this opportunity came along. It's like, yeah, let's do it. And it's been so, so amazing. I'm even going to the gym again after feeling relief. So in a couple of months, maybe you'll see me like really buffed. <laughs> <laughs> this guy throwing the Kinsen out the window. Yeah, right? Thanks, my friend. Thank you. So look at this. Crisscross technique. Just one side and then the other. One side and then the other. One side and then the other. And there you go, Daniel. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I, I, I've been trying to go at least three times a week uh, to the gym. And uh, it really clears my mind. It's been really, really helpful. Kind of distracts you a little bit. There we go. What, what, what is the hype train? I don't know what the hype train is. Let's go. Okay, so now I'm gonna start adding some more like, uh, like skin folds on this area. And remember what we mentioned, we need to, to make this a little bit thicker. It might seem like it's too much right now when I'm carving right here. But again, in 3D printing, if we don't push this hard, it's going to be very, very complicated to to uh, capture all of this detail. And all of this like interweaving of like skin folds and things, that's the kind of stuff, the texture that looks very, very nice. And as you can see, I'm not using alphas. It's a very common question that I get. Like, should we be using alphas? Alphas are great, but alphas are like the sprinkles on the top of a cake. So, so that's until the very end. Most of the stuff that we do should be able, or you should be able to do it uh, traditionally with just like sculpting. So we are gonna be adding some like fine details later on. Those, of course, are not going to be seen on the, on the 3D print unless we 3D print this like super, super big. But I, <laughs> I don't have the resolution or the resin to do that. Um, 
but it's uh, it's gonna allow us to like ma later on when we do like a displacement bake or something, we're gonna be able to see that. Look at that, beautiful, very cool. Dorky Bob says, "I'm too shy for the gym, so I do work at home, and I agree, it's very nice and helps with anxiety too." Thank you, Dorky, and the details look good. Yeah, I, I was very self-conscious about it, but uh, my brother, he's, he's very fit. He's been going to the gym for years. Uh, he goes to the same gym, and the trainer that is there, he's like a very good friend as well. Uh, Shoutouts to Good Abdiel. Uh, he's a personal trainer, and um, he's very cool as well. So so they've they they like having friends there allows you, well, uh, to me, it allows me to feel a little bit more <laughs> safe, more comfortable. Um, and people usually mind their own business, so... There's eventually the, like the, the guys that try to make a, a whole deal out of their workout. You know, they're recording themselves and things like that. But as long as you don't mess with that kind of people, then that's fine. Like the gym bros, right? We we've all seen this sort of like a gym bros effect. Sarn says gym actually gives you additional vibes to train harder and more effective. I was shy at the beginning too, but it's worth it. Yeah, it's definitely worth a try. I was, uh, back in the day, this was in like 2016, I was going to the gym like very frequently. I was way, way leaner than right now. Right now I'm a very chubby. <laughs> and um, and I felt great, but it was it was quite a, a huge, like I was going like two or three hours a day to the gym. So it was quite a big uh, time commitment. Nowadays with little kid, uh, family and work, it's a little bit more complicated, but yeah, at least three times a week, a week I feel like it's been, it's been, uh, it's been good. <laughs> And he's saying it's good to look at your muscles and to check the anatomy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And look at that. We got 23 viewers. We broke a record from last week. So thank you guys for watching. If you're watching and you want to see more of this stuff, make sure to follow and then check our other socials as well. So I'm going to keep this part of the character really clean. But I do want to add some little like indentations here and there. Kind of like skin, kind of like a striations. You know, to again to to give my character a little bit more. I I, I like to call this a visual interest. So we we always want to have. Uh, there's this rule, this design rule. It's called the one two three rule. Let me show you. This is this is I think one of the when I was taught this in school, I was like, wow, that's amazing. So if you're doing a composition, let's say you're doing like a like a little environment piece, you always want to have your one two three rule. So your one, two, three rule is you're gonna have your main thing. What's that main thing gonna be? Let's say like a little house, right? The door, that's the window. So that's your number one. Your number two is a detail that's gonna help make this house looks, looks a little bit better. So maybe it's like a tree, which is not gonna be as big as the first object, right? It's not gonna be as important, but it's gonna be like supporting the whole thing. And then the number three, that's the little detail that just like wraps the whole scene together. So in this case, for instance, it could be, I don't know, like a bicycle on the side of the house, right? So if you just see a house, okay, that's cool. If you see a house and a tree, that's like, okay, that's a little bit cooler. But then you see the bike, and this is already kind of like telling a story because this bike belongs to someone. Is he the kid? Is he a, a youngster? Is he the, like a like an old person? Like that bike is already making you ask questions like who lives here, right? So we get the one, the two, and the three. So in the case of characters, of course, the one is the main character. The two are all of the secondary shapes and the three are these little details right there. These little details are gonna let you understand it's like, hey, how, like, what are those? Are those like, parts of a membrane are those parts of the skin or it's just like visual interesting things that are gonna like like make the whole thing look cohesive right like a like a single project how important is 3d or what how important is traditional art training in 3d i would say it's important it's not mandatory but it's really beneficial <laughs> kind, of, kind of like what we're talking about the gym right so if you understand traditional concepts in drawing, such as perspective, uh, shadows, slides, and all that kind of stuff, then doing 3D or learning 3D can also be very beneficial to us because it allows us to transfer that information into the 3D world. Again, it's not completely necessary. I've had I've had a lot of friends who are not as well prepared in the in the um, like traditional um, art thing, but it's really really helpful. It's really helpful. If you can train a skill, you don't have to know all of the skills, but if you can train a skill such as sculpting, drawing, or painting, it's definitely gonna help you on your um, on your professional career. 
I personally like doing a lot of uh, sculpting. Like uh, I, I like traditional sculpting and I like uh, painting. I don't like drawing like uh, lines and me, <laughs> we do not mix. I, I always have very scratchy lines, but painting, um, I, I do like painting and I feel like I'm quite proficient at it. There we go. Now let's go on this part right here. I'm gonna look for another reference because that one's definitely, <laughs> It's getting a little bit complicated. Okay, there's this this very cool one. This one is by an artist goes by the name Tooth Wu. So Tooth Wu has this very cool element, and look at that. So it has this sort of like flabby sort of like membranes on the side, and then all of these veins. So I think that looks cool. Let's try to implement a little bit of that into our design. So over here, we can start adding like this elements right here, and we can add a couple. We can kind of fade them out. And that's how you, actually, I kind of want to like a bigger one. That's how you get inspiration, by analyzing people's work and uh, finding things that you like and just implementing them in your work. Yeah, traditional sculpting is very fun and it's actually it's a little bit expensive because if you want to like get some good results you do need good clay um there was a, a brand that we use uh, back at school called chavant it's really really good clay but really expensive each brick was like uh 20 dollars or something uh but you get some really nice results because it holds right like if you try to do a sculpting with play doh uh no nah. <laughs> the result's not gonna be great so yeah if you want to do clay clay sculpting you do need some good clay here in Mexico, there's a, a vendor, he sells them in Mercado Libre, it's like, a, like our eBay, and it's called a Plasticera, so like a wax clay, and it's really good. It's not the same as Chavant, but it's, uh, it's close. So I, I've, I've bought some of blocks from him, and, and it's, a, it's a good product. <laughs> Get a rock and a pick and stone sculpting. I, I really don't know how people did it back in the day for like marble sculpting, it's just... That's really, really freaking impressive. Because one mistake and you're gone. Your rock is like completely, completely fucked. Can we say bad words here on Twitch? I think so. I'm not gonna say too many because I don't wanna get into trouble, but I was under the impression that we could. Some more like big lines right here going into the into the main tentacle. And then just smooth things out. Yeah we can, nice. But since we're gonna publish this in YouTube, I also don't wanna <laughs> don't wanna get into any issues with YouTube later. So yeah, guys, if you if you've missed a part of this uh, of this stream and you want to watch the full thing later on, we're also gonna be uploading this to uh, to YouTube. It's gonna air tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Well, tomorrow morning for me. <laughs> it might be afternoon for you because we got people all over the world. Where are you guys from? Let me know in the chat because I got a map over here. It's not visible right now, but I'm trying to get a, a student from every part of the world, and we're really close. We're really, really close. So yeah, say hi to the YouTube people because they're gonna be watching the chat as well. Salty York, Georgia. I'm gonna push the perspective here. Portugal, there you go. A question from Evgen, it says, how do you decide whether you should specialize in hard surface or environment or characters when you like doing all of them? That's a great question. So, um, I'm gonna give you a very realistic answer. If you want and, uh, and are trying to work on a big studio, 
my advice is to specialize because big studios are usually going to be going after specialists because they build teams of 200, 300 people for a game and that you're going to be in one specific department and that department is going to be doing one specific thing. So if you're a character artist, you're going to be doing character art. If you're an environment artist, you're going to be doing environment art. So if you're going to be working or you want to work in a big studio, specialization is, is going to give you the best chance to land a job there. If you're going to be working on a small studio or on a small region like where I am here in Saltillo, uh, there are like two or three studios <laughs> that do 3D maybe. So uh, one of us, uh, one of those studios is ours. So um, you got to be a generalist. So you're gonna be you're gonna be doing a little bit of everything. Like right now, my artists are working on a, on a cinematic, so they're doing like a, like lighting and cinematic shots and things like that. Um, and it's part of uh, it's part of the of the again you know, of the scope of the studio that you want to be working on. So I like doing everything. I like doing my favorite thing, of course, is characters. But I enjoy doing everything. That makes me a generalist. So I've always considered myself uh, more of a generalist than a uh, than a specialist. So yeah, depending on the on the size of the studio that you want to work in, you're either gonna specialize or you're gonna be um, what's the word? You're gonna be a, you're gonna become a generalist, where you're gonna be doing a little bit of everything. <laughs> MacMoon says, "Golpe Critico." It's my new studio. I'm gonna I'm gonna file a lawsuit against you, my friend, because I, I still got the trademark. <laughs> I still got the trademark. Oh, critical hit! Critical hit! Uh, Mac Moon is, uh, is is doing a reference to Critical Hit, which was my former studio before the pandemic hit. Um, it was a great studio. The pandemic was horrible for everyone. Like not only human lives were lost, but uh, a lot of businesses went under, a lot of studios went under. My studio was one of those. We had five artists working there. And uh, fortunately, everyone had found something. So after that, we're, we're still doing art. No one had to change careers or anything. But it was a really, really, really bad time. Because we thought the, the quarantine was gonna last just like a month or something, and it ended up lasting almost two years. So it became unsustainable for a lot of people. Dorky Boop is from Naples. Nice. Nice. Oh, that must be very nice. Summer camping in Naples. Get some... Uh, if you're over 18 or 21, get some nice wine. In our honor. I'm not a huge wine guy, to be honest. When I drink, I prefer whiskey. But, uh, but the wine is very tasty. We got some very big uh, winemakers here in the in the state. Future goals, yeah, there you go. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. We still got an hour. That's great. That means that we're gonna be able to detail this guy quite quite nicely. What the hell is that? Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> Selected the wrong brush. Now we need to think a little bit about the pose because I, I don't want to have just like a like a boring straight pose right here. So one of the easiest ways to do a pose uh, already is here on the on the neck. I'm just gonna rotate the neck sideways a little bit, and just that little change. Look at how much look at how much character we get from just doing that little change right there. Like just rotating the shoulders a little bit, and we already get something that looks way way more interesting. So I'm just gonna rotate this sideways a little bit. Eventually we're gonna have. Um, like, I'm imagining this guy on, like, a little stand, right? So, like, a little metal box stand right there. And then maybe, like, a metal... A metal rod. Like, holding him like this. So if this was like a like a collection piece, like imagine we 3D printed and painted very nicely and everything, I would imagine that this thing would be like roughly around like this. Maybe a little bit smaller for the base. There we go. That looks a little bit better. Just want to make sure not to touch the tentacles. But yeah, imagine this little like statue on your office or something. I think that would be quite nice. 
Uh, would be cool to post the same as the reference. As this reference, that would be really tricky, especially because we don't have uh, a lot of, uh, of things. One thing we can do, though, is we could, like, rotate the head slightly forward so that he looks a little bit meaner. But, yeah. Oh, wait. Yep. This one right here, the top face, we don't need it anymore, so I'm just going to delete. There we go. This is the one that we have. Sadly, in Portugal, there are not much studios, but there is one that's medium big. The name is Saver Interactive. Yeah, but here's the thing, and, uh, and this is a question that I get asked quite frequently. Like, I think that the future of 3D is a globalization kind of thing, and it's already happening. Like, I have a lot of friends in the United States that are saying that a lot of work is being shipped elsewhere because the prices in the U.S. are getting a little bit too difficult to, to maintain, and you guys know corporations always like to have, like, the best profits. So... These things will diversify, and you are going to see more and more studios opening in overseas and in other places. And also, another thing that you guys should consider, I always tell this to, to my students, the big name studios, Blizzard, Riot, uh, Activision, and all of these guys, they're not the only places. There's a lot of uh, small studios or medium level studios that are really good as well. We were just talking about Larian, right? Like Larian is, uh, I would say it's considered a AAA studio, but it's not considered the same as like Blizzard or, or Riot, right? So there's there's a lot of work out there. But if you just focus on like the super big brands, then you're gonna you're gonna be like robbing yourself of the opportunity of discovering other cool places to work at. So, so yeah, don't don't close your mind onto onto other like smaller size studios because there's a there's a lot of that stuff out there as well. Don't forget to save. Yes, my God. <laughs> there we go. Quick save for now. I don't know how we've been working. What like one an hour without save? That's a that's a risky that's a risky thing to do. Adding a little bit of texture here on the whole thing. I'm gonna go a little bit heavier on this false. I really like Mind Flayers. They're I feel like they're heavily inspired, of course, by um, Lovecraft, you know, Cthulhu sort of thing. So, they're always very cool. I did use them on, on my campaign once. They almost killed two of my players. Because, again, they, they have this, like, very powerful abilities. And if you don't have good stats on your characters, they can be very punishing. Because they attack your intelligence. So, people usually dump intelligence when they're creating their characters. Especially, like, barbarians and things like that. So... There was one Barbarian and one Rogue, I think. And they were they didn't have very high intelligence, so... There was this, like, psy psionic blast that uh, just caught them square in the face. And uh, and they didn't pass the save, and they, <laughs> they, got, they go immediately down. Did you guys watch the D&D movie, by the way? I really liked it. I thought it was really good. Yeah, it's really good. If you can catch it online on, on streaming, it's, it's a really fun movie, to be honest. Even people who are not into D&D, they, they, they can get a laugh out of it because it's a... Uh, it, it's not like a... Uh, there's a lot of D&D lore, so if you know it, you can enjoy it a little bit more, but... Um, it's it, it's like a very stupid film. Like that That's pretty much what happens when you play D&D. So it's like a very like true-to-life sort of like uh, experience. Move some volume here. And there we go. What resources or tools do you recommend for someone starting the 3D world? That's a great question. So if you're just starting your 3D world and you want to like learn 
quickly and efficiently. Uh, of course, we have uh, our own YouTube channel, but uh, Blender is a great way to start. I think Blender is the best place to, to start learning about the 3D world. And then if you like it and you feel like you want to work in the big industries, switching to Maya, it's a great idea as well. You can, of course, start with Maya, but it can be a little bit more challenging because the tools are a little bit more professional. So, so you might feel like certain things are not as easy to understand. Other than that, um, CG Channel, it's a perfect, like a perfectly good website to check for news and information about the 3D world. And uh, YouTube in general has so, so many, like uh, co so much content. ArtStation is also a great way to find uh, inspiration. Now, as for, for softwares, uh, yeah, like ZBrush is one of them, Blender is one of them, Maya, After Effects and, and Photoshop are also great tools. I always recommend to know a little bit about Photoshop for post-production. So yeah, I think that's what, that would be my my suggestion there. Start to save money for ZBrush license. Unfortunately, ZBrush license is no longer perpetual. Like even if you buy the perpetual license, which is very expensive, you still need to buy it every year to, to get the updates. So you buy the license and you get one year of updates. Um, the way to go, unfortunately, and I hate, I hate that it is this way, but it's to buy the, um, the subscription. So right now I am paying for the subscription. It's $45 a month, which, I mean, based on the specialized work that we do, you can get it back fairly easy, to be honest. Like, uh, like, like if I was to sell this guy right here, like someone told me, hey, I need a, a 3D sculpt of this guy, I would sell it at least for like $100 or something. And uh, and that way you already get back your license, right? You're the, the price for the license. And it's only taking me like like two, two hours to do this model. So, um, so yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's now subscription based. You can still, or at least, uh, I, I still have my perpetual license, but it stopped in 2021 or 2022, I think. So you don't have all of the new things that, uh, that the new versions are bringing to the table. Daniel says, right now I'm doing the mech line tutorial. See the good one. After finishing that one, I'll start the blender course. But in this case, I'll use Maya. Yeah, if you're gonna use that one, if you're gonna use the, if you're gonna see the, the blender or the weapon blender course, and you're gonna be using Maya, you might need to use ZBrush as well because we do go over sculpting. That's one thing I think Blender has over Maya. The fact that it has some nice sculpting tools, like you can get some really, really cool things like the axe. So you're gonna have to do a little bit of ZBrush probably um, to get like the volcano and the and handle done properly. But everything else, all of the modeling ticks and techniques, that's a very like universal workflow that you can apply pretty much everywhere. Let's do another cut right here. Yeah, yeah, that one, that one should work perfectly fine, uh, Daniel. Perfectly, perfectly fine. I took a student license for ten dollars half a year. Yeah, if you have access to that one, that's great, Alpha Omega. And uh, unfortunately. The schools that where I teach right now, they don't offer that license, so we don't have access to to Seabrush at that price. But yeah, if you can get that, that's just like the best deal ever. I'm not sure if Noman has it actually. Do I still have my Noman mail? Maybe. That could be a good one. <laughs> that could be a very cheap way to get it, to be honest. But yeah, if you have access to your your student license for any software like Photoshop and Substance Painter, Substance Designer, Substance Sampler, they they offer a lot of like student discounts. So if you have access to those, make sure to use them. Here I'm just adding random volumes on the back, like this sort of like meaty, I don't know, weird flappy thingies. What kind of 3D artists are most required in the industry at the moment? It always fluctuates, Evgen. It's a, it's a really funny thing, because sometimes you're going to have the need for a lot of modelers, and sometimes you're going to have the need for a lot of animators, and sometimes it's, again, like, it's it's always like a like a switch between we need modelers, we need animators, we need artists, we need animators or actors. So it's a, it's a, it's a complicated thing. Um, there are certain, like, careers that are always required, like uh, riggers. Riggers are always required because no one likes to do rigging because it's a lot more technical. So so that can be a good option. But as long as you're good, like um, as long as your portfolio is competitive, it's it's easy to get a job. However, I, I must say that uh, sculptures and modelers, there's a lot of people that do that. So you need to be really, really proficient, really, really good because uh, the the Again, like the playing field or the amount of people that do that, it's, it's a lot more important. 
I, I like to use the soccer analogy. I'm not sure if you guys are fans of soccer. I'm not that a fan, but here in Mexico, you, you need to be a fan, otherwise <laughs> you're ostracized. So in soccer, you got one goalkeeper, usually like uh, four defenses, three like mediums, and three um, and three offensive guys, right? And usually the ones that get the most like uh, uh, like the most fame are the the offensive guys, like uh, Messi, right? Like the, the guys that make the goals. So it's um, it's very similar in the 3D world. Like character artists are usually the ones that you hear the most about, where the defense players, like texture artists, environment artists, asset artists, riggers, they're very important as well. So so it's a matter of finding. Uh, th there's a there's a very interesting concept in in Japanese culture uh, called ikigai. Ikigai. I'm not sure if you guys have heard that concept, which is like your purpose in life. So it, it mixes like a lot of things, but one of those is something that you like to do and something that you're really good at and something that you can profit from. So if you can find that like a golden point right there, that you're, you're set for life pretty much. Yeah, just say they'll, you're, you're right. Like again, and that's because character artists usually have this fame of being like the rock stars of the of the whole thing. Back when I started, actually animators were the ones that had that title, but nowadays uh, a lot of uh, things have shifted and now uh, uh, character artists get the, like that sort of like title. But that's the, that's the thing, like everyone wants to be a character artist. If you want to be a character artist, you need to be good. Otherwise, you're not gonna get a job because there's so many people out there. So so that's the, it's like the, the tricky part, the tricky balance that you need to find. That's why I like to be a generalist, because yes, I can do characters, but I can do props, I can do environments, I can do vehicles, I can do a little bit of everything. So that allows me to be a little bit more flexible and, um, and make sure that I'm employed as much time as possible. Will there be a lot of overtime in the industry, even in big, yes. Yeah, big, big studios, especially in the US, they do a lot of overtime. Um, not all of the industries, usually uh, if you're working in, in movies and in games, yes, there is a lot of overtime because time is very intense there. Like they, they want you to do a lot of things in a very short amount of time, so they expect to... And there's a lot of redos. I think that's one of the issues about like games and, and film. They usually have a lot of reshoots and, uh, and changes. Um, it's, like a, it's like a very ugly chain of command where let's say the director likes your work and then they show it to the producers and the producers don't like it and then it goes back and then the director likes like your lead likes it your director likes it the producer likes it but then the 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 head of like a uh, corporate production does not and every time someone in that chain of command does not like something changes are going to be made and if time is uh, running low then overtime is going to be necessary and the same thing happens in games in commercials if you're doing commercials like advertisement since the time frame is very, very short, like you usually have like a month to do a commercial, like two months or three months, you need to be very, very sure of what you want even before you start. And, and there's not a lot of overtime, but the, the pace is a lot faster. So on your day to day, you're going to be doing a lot of stuff like way, way, way more quickly. Um, uh, Alpha says, I just sent photos of my student license to Pixelogic and a couple of days they confirmed student license. After that, I paid $10 for half the year. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. If you guys haven't tried that, follow uh, Alpha Omega's advice and you could get Seabrush for very, very cheap. Oh, we're one follower away from 250. Is someone in the chat not a follower yet? Because we're just one follower away from, from 250. There we go. Welcome. Just say Dolo. There you go. Welcome, my friend. Now, are we at 250? I'm not sure if I'm worth 250. This thing is not updating. I don't even know how many we have. Maybe I just tricked you. I'm sorry. The thing is, on my bitrate thing here over on my screen, it says that we're at. Uh... There we go. Now we've updated. 250. Perfect. There we go. Cool. So I think I think we're in a good position here with the um, what's the word? I think, oh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for that. Um, I think we can go to the chest and do a little bit of uh, work here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back on the rotation, and as you can see, the chest is not like perfect. So I'm just gonna give it a couple of uh, subdivisions, and let's add a little bit of the body. So you can see it's a very human-like body. So I'm just gonna imagine that the that the deltoids are here. I'm gonna show you a very cool brush. This is kind of like an old school brush 
but we use this quite a bit to do like clean cuts and especially for this sort of statues they look very very nice so that's where we would expect the deltoid to be and then over here that would be like the like the chest muscle of course in the center of the chest muscle we'll see like a little bit of a, of a division thing right here like just a, a little bit of uh, fibers right there very important cuts right there for the for the neck muscles going up and then we usually see a little bit of the leg attaching itself to the clavicles right there and this guy's very fibery right very organic so so we can push this sort of thing a little bit more than what i usually do just to generate the a little bit more detail. Very important on the back because, again, this is going to be a 3D. If we 3D print this, should we 3D print this? Let me know in the comments or in the in the chat if we should 3D print this. But if we should 3D print this, we need to make sure that everything on all of the sides are like nicely, nicely sculpted. Alpha says there are also videos on YouTube on how to get a super student license. Yes, and and I saw some of them, and they talk about like registering for like a free university online, and then waiting a couple of days to get your like uh, like your student email, and then you email that. So yeah, it, it is possible. It is possible. Let's print and paint. Well, paint. I'm not sure if I can promise that because I don't have a setup to. I don't have a setup to, to show you the, the, the painting process. I will need to do a whole bunch of like movements here in my little studio. But 3D print, we can 3D print. I'll 3D print it today after the stream, and I'll show you guys the final print on the on the Discord. So if you're not on the Discord, make sure to jump there if you want to see the, the final result. Oh, by the way, I'm also 3D printing the, the Kindred mask, like real size, like huge size. So that one's going to be, I'm going to be showing that one very soon. Oh, that clavicle looks horrible. Let's straighten it up a little bit. <laughs> Don't worry, man. It's fine. No one, no one cares about nicknames. I mean, I've seen some really bad ones. Yours is not bad. I've seen some really bad ones that I don't even want to say on streams. Like, dude, just change that name. Okay, so here's the brush that I was mentioning. This is a very, uh, again, like old school brush, but it's really good. It's called the uh, Clip Curve brush, this one right here. It's Control Shift and it's the Clip Curve. So the way it works is you draw this line and all of the polygons that are on the side of the gradient are gonna be pushed towards the dotted line. So as you can see, we get this right here. They're not being erased. They're just being pushed towards that area. So if you do wanna erase them, another one we can use is the knife brush. But the knife brush, this knife curve, it's a little bit buggy. So even though we have saved, and I'm gonna quick save again. Actually, let me, let me normal save just in case. Let's call this my flare. There we go. So now I'm gonna do another cut like right around there. And I'm gonna do another cut back here and I'm gonna do a cut on the back as well so as you can see we get this very like nice sort of like clean cuts everywhere for the for the character uh, Dynamesh of course let's increase the resolution and now what I'm gonna do is with trim dynamic I usually like to kind of like damage the, the borders of this cut to make it look like chiseled stone marble you know I don't know kind of looks nice I think some people like the very clean cuts I was like as I told you this sort of like damage more organic uh, feel to the whole thing also sharp lines very sharp lines can be a little bit tricky to create the print so by doing this sort of like bevel everywhere Kind of make sure that uh, that we get a cleaner distribution. It's just a stylistic choice in this case. Yes, after after this character course, the next course is going to be a Maya course, and we're going to be doing an environment. 
So it's going to be like a intro, intermediate level Maya course where we're going to be doing a, a fantasy. Well, not fantasy environment. I want to. I, I, I have something in mind. I, I still need to, to think a little bit more about it. But the next quarter after this one is going to be Maya. And we're going to be switching. Maybe I think I kind of want to do a Marvelous Designer after the Maya one because I've been, I've been asked about that one quite a bit uh, in the last couple of months as well. So I think I'm going to make the chest a little bit bigger. And now we're going to rotate this. Well, we're going to do the rotation. Let's make sure that it's right on the center. There we go. And now, of course, we need to do a little bit of, uh, of merging here on the, on the head and on this side. And I'm going to go to the head now. I'm just gonna add a little bit of volume there to kind of merge together with the neck muscle. We could even like merge both elements into a single one. But I kind of like this sort of like division that we have. As long as we indicate it, I think we're fine. There we go. This summer? Yes, I mean, when is summer ending? Because. Uh, we're releasing the new one for August, and then for September, we're going to release a new one. So the idea is to release one course every single month. Again, the, the August the course is going to be the character, the Seabrush character course. And then the September course is probably going to be the, the Maya one. So yeah, it should be available really soon. The Rookies Award, the guy who won made a very cool environment. Yeah. Rookies is a very good competition. It's very, very cool. Okay. So how are we doing on time? <clears throat> we got 40 more minutes. That's great. I've been having a sore throat for the past couple of days. Well, actually, it started yesterday, so I'm going to take a little uh, pill. Sorry if I make some weird noises. So, what else should we do with this guy? Asymmetry, definitely asymmetry. A little bit of details like scars, and we're gonna do. We're gonna go for high frequency details. But before that, let me show you a new set of brushes that they just released. This one's literally were released this week. I think it was on on Tuesday or, or Monday. They're called the Anchor brushes. So on the brush menu, it's the first one right here, Anchor, and in, they're very interesting. The way they work is as follows. Let's say I mask out, I'm going to press W and mask out everything except for this tentacle. Let's go to the lowest subdivision level. There we go. Like this. So just hit control and I'm masking out everything except for this tentacle right here. And let's say I want to like move this tentacle, right? Normally, we would need to either move it like this or use move brush or something. Well, with this guys right here, you click once and then you click a second time. And then this second button is going to rotate from the point where you place the first one. So as you can see, I can use this to like rotate this thing in a slightly more like interesting way. So let's say I want to make this thing go in a little bit more and then this one's going to go out. So I mask again. Let's continue masking like right to that point. And then I click and then I rotate this one forward. You see that? And then control, we drag, and then we click, click, and then this one's gonna rotate from that point. And then control, we drag, control, we drag, and then we uh, click, and then use this one to rotate a little bit more. So it's a it's a really cool brush to be honest. It's um uh, it's really efficient, I would say. It's uh it's a little bit uh, again, it's very very new. Oh, we got uh, what was that? A sub? No, a follow. A sub. Thank you, my friend, for the sub. Thank you, thank you very much. So let's mask this again. And we click and click. And we're gonna rotate this. Forward. And the cool thing about this is we can actually like do or break symmetry a little bit. So if I click and click this one. Let's break symmetry. We can rotate like this and like this. So it's a it's a very cool way to to generate a little bit of variation, as you can see right there. So 
this one's gonna be follow flowing this way. Now let's mask this tentacle right here. There we go. So for instance, this this tentacle right here, I kind of want it to go across the other section. So I'm gonna click right there and click down here. And now if I rotate, I'm gonna be able to to create a little bit of a nice interweave right there. Look at that. And then we're gonna do another one right here. I'll answer your question in just a second, my friend. Give me just one sec. This one I'm gonna rotate forward. And then like this. Actually, let's let's do it to this side right here. Push it up a little bit. I feel like we lost a little bit of volume there, so I'm gonna use inflate. of uh, a little volume right there so uh, Daniel asks, is it okay to do a portfolio piece for or sorry is it okay to do a tutorial piece for your portfolio the answer is generally yes and the reason why people don't like to see portfolio pieces on uh, or sorry tutorial pieces on portfolios is because they know that if you follow the steps you're gonna get the same results so you don't need to be a genius or a really good artist to just follow a couple of steps the way you can do this is you finish the, the tutorial, you do the weapon or the whatever you're doing, like an art a blender tutorial. And once you are learned all of those things, you do a new project and apply all of the things that you learn on that new project. That's, I would say, the, the efficient way to use a tutorial to place a, or to get a piece on your portfolio. Another option, this is what I do nowadays, uh, because I, of course, feel a little bit more, um, what's the word? A little bit more um, proficient with all of the 3D things. One of the things that I do nowadays is I will, I will just if I'm if I'm watching a tutorial. Let's say I'm doing a tutorial about I don't know, like a a car, and the tutorial is doing a Mustang, right? Instead of doing the Mustang, I'm just gonna grab a different car and I'm gonna follow the same sort of like thought process and steps to do my own version of that tutorial. But you do need to be a little bit more. I'm not gonna say like advanced as an artist, but you need to have a little bit more understanding of what you're learning so that you can really use that technique. I'm using Move Topological here to, to create a nice little effect right here. Move Topological is a great brush because it will only move what's part of the same like island or selection. These tentacles are gonna be a paint print. <laughs> I'm already, I'm already regretting this decision, but uh, yeah. Question says, how do you handle client feedback and revisions? That's great. I'm gonna give you one tip. So when you have a client that wants a lot of changes, one of the things that you can tell him from the very beginning before you start is that you're gonna give him a specific set of changes, let's say two or three changes. And once the stage of the process is approved, you're not gonna be doing any more changes. That way, if you move forward and they want to change on the previous stages, you have a agreed and re agreement where they understand that that change is going to cost extra. And usually when you mention money, when you mention like, oh yeah, of course, I can change that. However, since we've already passed that stage of the production, it's going to cost you X amount more. They're like, oh no, okay, well, in that case, let's just leave it like that. They usually do it that way. But it's very important that you have a green, written agreement with the client so that they are not trying to play tricks on you. And it's very common. I've, I've even done this as a client myself where where I know that uh, I want to change and I always ask the person, can we do it? And if it can be done, that's great. But if it, it can't, you need to be very clear to the to the client and be like, no, that's going to take more time or more money. And if they don't want to pay for it, don't do it. Okay, don't do it. I know it's very, it, it sounds very harsh and it seems like you might lose a client, but that's not the type of clients that you want to have for yourself. So a little bit more volume here. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a nice trick, Sarn, but uh, if they find out that that's a tutorial, that's not the best place to be. 
So no, I think I think what uh, what someone is mentioning there, it's the it's the best option. Like try to follow the tutorial while doing a different kind of uh, character or weapon or environment and using the same thing. So again, let's say um, you're doing a tutorial about an environment and it's like a Japanese alleyway, right? Like an abandoned Japanese alleyway. Well, instead of doing that specific Japanese alleyway, try to do another type of alleyway with different props and different elements. And you take what you're learning from the tutorial and you apply it on your own concept. And that's going to get you a, a more uh, efficient result. Okay, I'm going to break symmetry here. I'm going to use my move brush to make one eye a little bit lower and the other one a little bit higher. Just to, again, like break things a little bit. I'm going to move this a little bit right there. I I'm not sure if I want to add the typical like scar on one eye. But we can add like a scar up here. So I'm gonna use Damien Standard here. I'm gonna add one scar right there, one very long scar. And then with my clay buildup, I'm gonna fill that scar so that it looks like this caloid sort of scar where you got like new connective tissue growing on that specific part. That's one way to do it. We can add another like little cut right here. Maybe another one right here and like those are the the little details that we can incorporate into our elements maybe even here on the tentacle you don't want to do them too symmetrical though so i'm going to try to to vary them a little bit these are so subtle that they might not even show on the uh, what's the worth? On print. Now, on this concept, I can see that the tentacles have like a ridge going around them. What do you guys think? Should we add a ridge on the tentacles or should we keep it um, like smooth tentacles? What do you think? We got a question. Is Renderman still a good render? Yes, it's it's an excellent render. Pixar, Lucasfilm, Disney, they use them all the time. However, it's a little bit more, again, like studio oriented so if you're a freelancer you're probably just going to be using something that comes included with the renders that you're using like blender cycles or arnold inside of maya rich you guys want a rich evgen says that they want a rich let me see if i can add it because the thing is <laughs> we broke symmetry so that means that we're going to have to we would need to do this uh like manually on all of the elements and i'm not sure we're going to be able to do that so instead, let's throw in some uh, like leather sort of effect to the whole thing. And uh, if we have, how much time do we have left? We still got like three minutes. So maybe what I can do is show you guys how to um, present this. Uh, someone was asking about uh, light setups inside of Maya on the Discord channel. And I'm gonna record a video about that soon. But uh, it might be a good idea to show some very simple like processes there. Yeah. So I, I still kind of want to like rotate the head a little bit. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the body and mask it. I'm going to go to this guy and mask it and this guy as well and mask it. And then if I go to the head, I can press W and I can press this little guy right here. This guy is going to activate all subtools. And if I go to the center of the mask right here, I'm going to be able to rotate the head and the eyes at the same time. I'm going to like slightly tilt the head of the character in this sort of like contrapposed to kind of way. So shoulders one side and the head the other side. And that way we're gonna get something, again, a little bit more interesting. There we go. So we get this like slight asymmetry on the character. And that of course gives us a very nice effect. Now I'm gonna grab my standard brush. I'm just gonna, this is a very simple like leather effect for the whole scheme. So I'm gonna grab this spray. And on the light box, on the alphas, there's this alpha called uh, just leathery skin. This one right here. Just double tap it. And if we start projecting it on top of the character, you can see that we get this very nice texture. I'm going to change this to CSUV. And I'm going to give myself one more subdivision level. So we're at 3 million points right now. And as you can see, this is a perfect good way to add the texture. And the texture is mainly there to, to break up the, the silhouette a little bit. I still think that's a little bit too much intensity. I'm going to make this bigger. I just want to add like a little bit of texture. This is not even going to be printable. 
like you're not gonna see that texture on the print but on the render we might be able to see it and as you can see this I'm doing this asymmetrically so that we don't have the exact same like damage and as we get to the tentacles this thing is gonna be getting smoother and smoother this could be a perfectly good exercise for texturing as well maybe we'll do a, a texturing tutorial next time standard I just want to add like a couple of big wrinkles here and there remember that you cannot solve all of the wrinkles with just like alphas so there will be certain wrinkles that you're gonna have to do on your own how we how will you do that texture to be printable uh, by Severus Gomez welcome to the chat by the, by, the, by the way my friend don't be afraid to ask any questions. So, if I wanted this to be printable, I would need to make it really crunchy. So, I will need to go here, increase the intensity quite a bit, and that's like the sort of like texture that you would need. But it also depends a lot on the scale, right? So, for instance, an action figure like this uh, Dritz that I have over here, the size of the head is just like three, three centimeters, like one inch, right? So, if I print this same character at one inch, like... It's just impossible to see that sort of detail. That's why I'm mentioning all of the big details, the big wrinkles, the big depths of the eyes and stuff like that. We need to be very careful to really like make them strong so that we can um, so that we can see them on the 3D print. If we print them on this side right here, like on a big scale, I have one character that was printed that way, then it might be possible to see a little bit of this texture, just like noise. But then once you add the primer and the paint and everything, all that detail starts getting like erased and erased and erased. That's why, again, it's very, very important, all of those, like, big wrinkles that we added to go a little bit harder than you might normally do just because um, you're going to lose a lot of that detail on the on the 3D printing thing. And even on the bakes, when you bake these things down into a, into a normal map, you also lose quite a bit of that uh, stuff. So, so you also need to take that into account. Cool. So I think we're ready to jump onto the um, onto the final part of this uh, of this uh, stream, where we're gonna be doing some rendering preparations, and maybe if we get enough time, we might have uh, time to prepare the 3D print, which is something that some people have uh, asked about. So let me very quickly just move my tab of the way. And if you guys have liked the stream so far and you're not following, what about we make a little exchange? I keep doing this, and uh, you guys help the channel. We're also really close to 1k subs in the in YouTube. So if you're not subscribed to YouTube, make sure to subscribe. There we go. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn off the base. I'm just gonna keep the character right here. And uh, I'm gonna do a geometry. And we're gonna do a merch. Or sorry, sub tool. Let's move this away. Merch, merch visible. And all of these guys are gonna be merged into a single element which is this one right here, with all of the geometry and stuff. Um, now that we have this, one of the things that we need to do is, ideally for a 3D print, we want to combine everything into a single into a single mesh. I mean, it can work this way, to be honest. Like, 3D printers are smart enough to... Uh, what's the worth? Why is this not working? Oh, there we go, there was a mask. I'm just gonna push the neck up a little bit more to make sure that there's overlap. So yeah, 3D printers nowadays are smart enough to know that uh, two pieces are meant to be together, so they just print them together. But ideally, you wanna combine them into a single mesh. So for instance, this, this tentacle right here, I would recommend pushing it against the skin a little bit, just so that it has a little bit of extra support. Same for this one right here, I would probably just push them. In that way, it's not floating around and um, it makes the whole thing a little bit more stable. Same thing for this one right here. Like, just having a little bit of overlap, like, just barely touching the tentacle, that helps quite a bit for the for the 3D printing process. This one, not much we can do about it, but um, but that uh, those, like, contact points in 3D print are, are really, really, really important. So, what we're going to do now is, of course, decimation, because this was, um, what's the word? This one's going to be, um, we, we can't just bring 1.34, like, points to, to Maya. So, I'm going to go decimation master, I'm going to pre-process current. Hmm. That's a great question, Gomez. 
So here's the thing. I, I recently like started this new brand. So a lot of the old tutorials that I did, they're super, super valuable. But if you get them, you're not supporting me anymore because they're not mine anymore. So if you can wait a couple of weeks for me to finish the course that I'm doing for ZBrush, that's going to be the best way to start. And then I promise you, I'm going to do a small course about 3D printing and, um, and and I'll get it to you so that you can uh, learn that like 3D printing side of things. Because I do have a 3D printing course I did before, but I think you're going to get more benefit from the one that I'm recording now. Because I got more knowledge and it's a little bit more up to date. So again, if you can just wait a couple of weeks before buying uh, the next course, that would be great. So I'm going to go here, see plugin and let's decimate 20% is usually fine. That's perfect, 268,000 points. And we're going to export this to the um, desktop. And this is going to be an FBX. And the merch my player is fine. Let's just wait for this to do it. And there we go. A little house exercise. Let's open Maya. Now, since we're not going to be using ZBrush anymore, I'm going to save this real quick. And let's close it to save some uh, performance. You want to see a sneak peek of the new course? I'll show you the result. I will show you guys right now the result of the first chapter. So this course that I'm doing, it's supposed to be, or it's going to be an intro to Seabrush. So if you've never used Seabrush before, I'm going to take you from the very beginning all the way to like a very cool character. Now, this first chapter that I'm going to show you, it's like two hours, I think, where I show you the basics of how sculpting works. Very similar to what we just saw here. I'm going to show you the, the, the tool right now. Because I'm really hyped about that one. And it's not the main character. So, so I think you guys are going to like it. Give me one second. Uh, where is it? There we go. So we're going to go from this. From this little head right here. To this in the first chapter so we start with the very basic base mesh and i'll show you all the necessary things that you're gonna need to get to that like a cool dragon head right here and this is again this is just to get you used to the interfaces uh, or to the interface of, of zbrush to how it works to how like the general sculpting mindset should be we go over uh, a lot of the brushes and uh, again, the main workflows. And after that, we do a little bit of an environment piece. And once we finish the environment piece, we go and do the character. So yeah, yeah, exactly. This is just a warm up. This is just chapter one. So this is just get used to ZBrush, understand the main tools, and then we start working on the on the actual things. So yeah, I, I really like how this one turned out. It's, uh, it's supposed to be like a dragon head, of course. We use the Tyrannosaurus Rex like a reference to, to get this close to this level. And it's a great, I think it's a great, great first exercise for anyone learning ZBrush. So this is going to be available again very, very soon. I'm making sure that we got the best quality so that you guys can get the best, uh, the best education. I'm going to go file and let's import the... Um, but, but, but merge mind flayer. There we go. That's a nice crack. Cool. So we got our head right here. And uh, the first thing I like to do is uh, set this up in a way that's uh, real size. So we got you, you should know, it's very important, that every single software has its own units. So if I create a little cube right here, this cube measures one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So it's one cubic centimeter. And this head right now, it's about like five or six centimeters. So if we want to make this a real like size head, it will probably be like 30 centimeters or something at least. So I'm going to go here to the scale on the scale on Y. I'm going to set this to 30. And that should be the very basic like size of the head. So I would say roughly around that. This guy's supposed to be a big guy. So I'm going to scale this up so that we get a nice head right there. It's, it's not fantasy. Do you want to see the end of chapter two and maybe get an idea of, of, of what it could be? <laughs> you guys are being sneaky. You guys are getting more than I was willing to show, but uh, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you the end of chapter two. Give me one second. 
So the end of chapter two is again, it's another chapter, chapter two. We, we kind of like slow down a little bit just to get used to all of the tools inside of ZBrush and, um, and get the environment where we're gonna be presenting the final character. So chapter two is an environment piece. We do this right here. It's simple, it's not as like epic as the head, right? But we go over some important tools inside of ZBrush that we're gonna need for the whole character creation. Uh, yes, I think we, we can touch a little bit about 3D printing, uh, Gomez. Uh, I think it would be nice to include a little bit of information at the very end. So this right here is the environment where the character is gonna be. And we go again over some of the main brushes, some of the main tools. This is chapter two, and after chapter two, we start working on the actual character. So that's it. That's all I'm gonna show today. That's the the sneak peek for the next uh, for the next uh, course. And again, I'm trying to make this course in a way that even a beginner can follow. So that if you have absolutely no experience with ZBrush, you're gonna be able to to follow along because we start we start a little bit like epic with the head, and then we slow down a little bit with the gait, which is gonna be important to learn some of the main tools, and then we go directly into anatomy and the character. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a huge uh, it's a huge one. Thank you, Wember. See you back on the next one, my friend. And if you want to see the rest of the stream, it's going to be on YouTube tomorrow. So make sure to follow there as well. Okay, so I'm going to go here to rendering. Let's go to our camera, panels, look through selected. And we are going to do a square uh, resolution here. So on the render settings, I'm going to change this to 2K square. And we're going to do this right here. Now, usually the camera by default in Maya has a 35 millimeter lens. It tends to be very wide. So for characters, I like to go for like a 90 millimeter, which is a little bit straighter. It's gonna give you more of a portrait sort of, sort of look. So something like this. Now, one of the things that I wanna do is I wanna bring back the little like box that we have. So let's create a box right here. This is gonna be like the, like the base. It's gonna be a small base. We don't wanna take away from the, from the main character. So I think something like this is fine. And now I'm gonna create a cylinder so that's the, the rod that's going to be going from the base to the character. So something like this. I definitely need to bring the whole base back a little bit. Just so that the rod is not like going through the character. That's it. That looks very balanced right there. This box right here, I am going to bevel it. Uh, two segments in a small fraction. So we got nice round corners. And there we go. Let's say real quick. Let's call this Mind Flayer Render. And, um, and we're gonna continue with the render. So panels look to select it. Let's find a, a nice element right here. I think we, since we have a little bit of an environment and a, an infinite background is gonna be a good idea. So I'm gonna create a big plane right here. Get it right here on the bottom of the character. And we're gonna grab this guys and extrude up. Then this one, we're gonna move it a little bit up and a little bit up. And that's it. So now we get a, a nice, like, infinite plane there for a background. Let's save. Um, let's see. Alpha Mega says, wanted to ask why lots of people make normal mapping instead of exporting it really from ZBrush. Are there? Um, th that's a great question. So ZBrush does have a way to bake normal maps, but to be honest, the bakers that we have inside of uh, Substance, Marmoset, and other elements, they tend to be a little bit better. So the technology that they have, tends to give you cleaner looking normal maps. That's why people usually bake them outside of uh, outside of ZBrush. Uh, question from uh, Sarn says, uh, what are your thoughts on the future of 3D art and technology like BR and AR? BR and AR are gonna change the world. It, it's still on in the early stages, like people are not adopting it as much as, as they should, I think, but it's such an amazing technology. We've been doing VR projects for a couple of years now. It's such an amazing technology. The problem is still it's a little bit expensive, but it's, it's, it's gonna be so important, especially in the manufacturing industry. So people that work on factories and things like that, having virtual training so they understand the processes without having to stop the machines or, or get injured or and stuff like that, it's gonna be super, super important. So VR and AR, guys, it's the future. If you can get into those industries, believe me, you're not gonna be out of work because there's always gonna be things to do. Okay, so panels look through selected and we got a very nice shot right here. I think I'm gonna give it a little bit of a three quarter view right here, maybe to this other side right there. And let's start working on the lights. So for the lights, I'm gonna add an Arnold Skydome light. 
and on the skydome light i'm gonna connect a file and this is gonna be an hdri so i got two right here i got this dancing hall and this pine attic i'm thinking i'm think i'm gonna go for the dancing hall because it has a more neutral tone to it so i'm just gonna hit open and remember you can get free hdris in polyhaven a super amazing uh, web page for for this sort of stuff and uh, yeah that's it now we can do a very quick uh, render test so i'm gonna go over here change system to gpu and i'm gonna say arnold and render the the stream might lag a little bit so sorry about that let's see there we go yeah so uh here's my opinion about that alpha I don't think BR gaming or AR gaming is going to be that big, to be honest. And I am a gamer. I love games. I cannot stand using BR for a long time. So right now we, we have a, a project in a, in a local museum, very big project. And uh, we make experiences, right? Like uh, like virtual like uh, uh, experiences for people to go to the dinosaurs or to the Ice Age. Right now we're finishing one for a desert, like a magical trip. Very cool. And we always need to make them between five and eight minutes long because after that, especially someone that's not used to VR, they get headaches, they get tired, they get like uncomfortable. So, so I think VR is good in small doses. Like uh, if you're playing Beat Saber on a party and you do your song and then you pass it to the next person, that's fine. But if you're gonna be playing for two hours, it can be very heavy, especially if you're not used to it. So I'm not sure about the future of VR for games, but it's definitely gonna be there, of course. What are my specs on this computer? That's a great question. So I got six, uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM. I got a Ryzen 7 uh, 5800X or something like that. I got a NVIDIA 3080 Ti. And, um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Like those are the main components. There we go. So it, it, it's, it's fast. It's not the fastest computer ever, but it is it's fast. It allows me to do very quick renders. There we go. So as you can see, the material that we have right now is horrible. So I'm going to grab the character, assign a new material, and I kind of want to make this a sort of like clay effect. So I'm going to go Arnold, AI standard surface, and I'm going to change this to M clay. And uh, the clay that I've mentioned before was this Chavant clay. So the Chavant clay is the one that we use in sculpting, and it has this sort of like green hue to it, this one right here. So as you can see, it's it's kind of like a little bit rough, not too rough, and it's got this very nice like greenish hue, like a gray green hue. So I'm gonna try to go for that. So I'm gonna go over here. Let's go green, low value, low saturation, really low saturation. And we're gonna go for like the mid tones right here. On the roughness, I'm gonna increase the roughness quite a bit. And if we take a look at the render, look at that. That looks really good. I think I'm going to increase the roughness a little bit more. Just to make it a little bit more like clay. And look at that. It looks like a like a little clay figure, right? Uh, this is why I mentioned the all of the details. It's important to push the details like quite a bit so that we get this very, very nice effect on the, on the character. Now the base, let's make this new material. Arnold AI standard surface this is going to be a black glossy material, not too glossy. And then this one, the, the pipe, it's going to be a standard surface. It's going to be a metallic material, a little bit shiny. So now if we render, it's going to look like a, like a little collectible statue, right? So not bad, not bad. Uh, the background, I'm going to also add a new material, Arnold AI standard. And this one's going to be a darker material, really rough, really matte. Way, way darker. The reason why I want a dark background is so that we can see the figure a lot more, right? Like we wanna we wanna make sure that um, that we get this right here. Can we get? Can you get a similar clay render in the blend? Yes, of course. Like Maya and Blender can get pretty much the same thing. Um, I'm, I'm actually that's another. Uh, could, could you write that down, David? Let's do let's do a video on YouTube about uh, clay render. I think that's a that's a great uh, topic. Like uh, Maya clay render and Blender clay render. That's. Uh, I think that's a, an interesting thing to cover. Yeah, maybe in 20 years, like in Ready Player One, I think that could be a, an option, like with the full suit and stuff. That would be that would be really really cool. Cool. So uh, now here's the thing: HDRIs are really good, and you can see we get a very nice result. And even if we add here like a, a denoiser optics uh, filter, this is gonna clean the image and it's gonna give us a very nice result. 
Look at that, so no noise whatsoever. And HDRIs are really good, but the thing about the HDRIs is that they do not do the full job. So you always want to to put your own like twist to it, to, to light your scene in a way that you can generate something that looks even more interesting. So that this is very sad to me because I've seen a lot of portfolios where people upload things like this. They, they do an amazing model and then render it but they just used an HDRI and that's it. And, and oh, they, it's, it's like wasted potential when I see it. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grab my HDRI and on the exposure, I'm gonna set this to minus two. What this will do, and I'm actually gonna save like screenshots here so you can see the progress. What this will do, as you can see, is it will darken the whole scene. So we still get this very nice bounce light around the whole element, but it's, it's a little bit less, um, what's the word? Less intense. So I'm gonna save the snapshot here so that we can start comparing. And the first light that I'm gonna add is what we called a key light. So I'm gonna go Arnold lights. I'm gonna create a new area light. And this key light that I'm gonna add here, I'm actually gonna do a slightly different setup. I normally do the three point light setup, but I'm gonna do a different one right now. This is called the uh, cross, what do we call it? Like double cross or something like that. It's when you have one light on one side like this, and then the other one on the other side. So this one's gonna be right there. And if we render, this was a, someone on the, on the Discord was asking this gesture is like, why are lights not working? It's not that they're not working, but lights in Arnold, any blender, they work in real world scales. So if the light is very small or the intensity of the light is very small, you're not going to see anything. So in this particular case, we need to increase the exposure to something like a 15 or something. Let me bring my music back. There we go. So by pushing this to 15 on the exposure and rendering, now we're going to start seeing some light. And again, since this is real world scale, we definitely need to push this a little bit more. So let's try something like an 18. That's way too much. We're burning the image. We're, we're getting some very high exposures there. So we need to bring it back. So when you're working with exposure, you guys got to remember that exposure is a, an ex exponential growth. So the more light that you have or the more numbers that you have, it's it's like exponential. So you, you want to like try to manage numbers in a small quantity. 17 is st 17 still too much. Let's try 16. That's a little bit better. I think 16.5 is probably going to give me what I'm looking for. There we go. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this light and I'm just going to duplicate it and bring it to the other side. And again, this is similar to the three-point light setup. It's again slightly different because we get a different type of shadows on the character. Let's save this to compare and let's render. So now we get this one right here. It looks a little bit more like a photo studio. You get this very nice like dark line going in the middle of the, of the character. I kind of want to push this back a little bit to get a little bit more shadow. I'm going to push it back as well. Remember, the distance of the light also affects how much light we get. There we go. That looks a little bit better. I'm going to push it in a little bit more. Nice. And finally, I'm going to add a rim light. Rim lights are always a good way to, to like make your stuff look a lot nicer. So I'm going to add a small rim light here on the back of the character, like pointing directly to the, to the back of the head. Now, one thing that I don't like about rim lights, you can see right here, is that we get this weird shadow on the back. To minimize that, you can change the size of the element here on the spread. And by minimizing it, it's only going to be like pushing or, or like pointing the light to the top of the character right there. I'm going to move it a little bit, rotate it a little bit right there. And there we go. Now, do you guys want to see something cool? You guys want to see uh, subsurface scattering? So surface scattering is where we get this sort of like skin effect on the on the character and I think this could look very very nice for this particular character. So right now it looks like clay, right? Like a plastic, like complete solid plastic. But usually clay has or clay and a lot of materials, the skin specifically, wax for instance, they have this effect where thin areas are a little bit more translucent than uh, thick areas. And this guy has a lot of thin and thick areas. So the way to do it is very simple. We're going to grab the object right here. And on the clay properties, we're going to go to subsurface and we're going to turn it on. This, by default, turns off the color. So we're going to bring the color all the way down. And if we render now, it's going to look very weird. So you can see it looks completely white, but you can see certain parts of this white are going to be a little bit more translucent than other parts. It kind of looks like milk or like cream. So you're going to get this very interesting effect. So what we need to do here is I need to go back to the subsurface. In the subsurface color, we're going to bring back the, like, the nice uh, color that we had before. So now if we do this, you're going to see that we get back our color and the subsurfacey areas, look at this, this looks like wax, like marble. So the thin areas are going to look a little bit more transparent, like on this area or like the tentacles down here. 
And right now we get this white color because the radius on the subsurface color is this white color as well. So what we're gonna do here to, to change the effect on this thing is change the color. So if we go to the same like, like dark green color, you're gonna see that now the effect looks a little bit closer to like the waxy effect that we would expect from the, from the character. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Finally, if you want to reduce the amount of effect, you can increase the scale or actually decrease the scale to like a 0.5, and that's going to minimize the effect that you get from the subsurface. It's not going to be as intense as what we had before. But it's going to give us this very, very nice, again, like clay look effect for the, for the whole thing. And now we can compare. This was the original light that we had. First key light, two key lights and a rim light, and a slight little change on the on the material itself. One more thing that we need to do, of course, is increase the samples. We're playing with two little samples, so I'm gonna go here to Arnold, enable adaptive samplings. I think 10 should be more than enough. It's gonna take a little bit longer, but it's gonna give us a really, really nice render. So let's just stop and play. So you can see the progress bar down here. It's definitely gonna be a little bit slower, but it's gonna be really, really, really cool. And now this could potentially be a portfolio piece. I wouldn't consider this to be a portfolio piece, and I've mentioned this before. When you're doing something, like anything in the 3D world, if you can do it fast, like what we did here in two hours, then that means that this is not my real full potential. If I did the same character, but I spent, I don't know, 20 hours, like 10 times more time, that could potentially be a portfolio piece because it shows that I can do things to like a really, really high level. This is something that I would share in my socials, in my Facebook, in my Twitter, in my Instagram, just to like show what we've been doing, but it's not something that I would include in my portfolio because the portfolio literally has to be the best thing you can do. And I know I can do this even better. Maybe sculpting, we're really close, but if I wanted to make this better, I would do retopology, I would do textures, I would do the full body, of course. So you, whenever you're preparing your portfolio, you should always try to do the best possible one right here. Okay, so spend as much time as you can and get an amazing piece for it. And uh, well, I think that's pretty much it, my friends. What do you guys think? Good class today. Did you enjoy the, the whole process? We had a lot of viewers along the time and a lot of chat, so yeah. Yeah, Alpha, you're right. A lot of people think that uh, that the uh, art station is like Instagram and you just shared your progresses and things like that. I was thought that that's not the case. And, um, and I was taught this by the best in the industry, so maybe we should listen to them, right? So, yeah, don't treat ArtStation as your personal blog. If you want to share, like, works in progress or little things that you did, that's fine. But do that on your own time, like, on your own, like, pages, not on, the, on Instagram. Great info! That's dope! It was an amazing stream with love, great info. Thank you. No, thank you guys. And um, remember that this stream is going to be available on YouTube tomorrow, so in about, like... 12 hours, 16 hours or something like that. We're gonna be doing, um, we're gonna be having this in the, um, in YouTube. Make sure to subscribe. We also have shorts every now and then. Today, today's gonna be a very fun short, so expect it later in the day. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you very much for the support. Amazing, amazing stream today. I've enjoyed it thoroughly, so so thank you, my friends. Thank you for, the, for this time. And uh, if you wanna check all of our socials, it's gonna be right here in the chat. Uh, uh, David is uh, like updating that right now and make sure to join our discord as well that's it my friends thank you very much I'll see you back on the next one